Hello, today I'm going to talk about the question, why do things happen? And it's going to lead us to thinking about the idea of nature. Now the word nature is a, it comes from a Latin word, natura, which means basically nature. Um, that word in Greek was physis, which is where the word physics comes from. So this is really exciting for me as a physicist because when you talk about physics, we're talking about nature in some way, in a, in a very specific way. So to give an example, um, you might imagine somebody who asks, uh, if you imagine a falling object, why does this thing fall? And uh, if I asked you that uh, in a classroom, you know, one or more of you would raise your hand and say, gravity. Um, and that's not wrong, uh, but it doesn't really lead you to an understanding of what gravity is. It's just a recognition of the fact that if I have something and let it go, it's going to fall. Uh, it's kind of neat uh, when I let that happen. It happens a little bit later in the, uh, the video that I'm seeing of myself, which is strange. All right. Um, so what is nature? Um, that's a, a actually a really important question, a question that uh, if we had a simple answer, uh, we could maybe, it would color the way we look at the world. Uh, it'd be really interesting. Now, you might say, oh, let's look at a dictionary and see what the dictionary says about nature. Um, but I will tell you right away that that's the wrong thing to do. Um, you have some idea in your head of what nature is. And by thinking about that idea and really exploring that idea, that experience you've had with nature, you're going to come to a much deeper understanding of what nature means um, and how uh, we interact with it and how, uh, how it affects us. If you have a dictionary, you kind of cut off that further exploration and uh, that further thinking about what nature really, really is. So over here, I've given some kind of examples uh, in blue of things we associate with the idea of nature. And so one is just uh, the idea of a nature walk. Um, you know, you might uh, have a special friend uh, and want to go for a nature walk. And on that nature walk, maybe in a park, maybe in a, you know, a little woodland place, uh, you'd expect to see maybe birds building nests and badgers doing badger things and uh, little critters feeding little baby critters and, and who knows what kind of stuff you see on nature. Uh, trees and flowers and plants, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you took a walk down Michigan Avenue in Chicago, uh, what you'd see would be something completely different. You'd see people talking to each other, interacting with each other, maybe parents with their children. Uh, you'd see store windows full of fancy objects. You'd see giant apartment buildings and office buildings, uh, all sorts of things that we don't think are our nature. All right, you might go, you might go to a natural history museum. Uh, there's lots of good natural history museums in uh, Chicago, Milwaukee. Um, and if you went inside one, you'd see things from nature. You'd see uh, examples of rocks or seashells or butterflies or bones they dug up from the past uh, and so on. You probably would not go, if you want to study nature, to the Art Institute of Chicago or the Art Museum up in Milwaukee. Um, there you'd see paintings and sculptures, things made by humans, uh, things that in some way are artificial. Uh, that word art uh, and the word artificial come from the same basic idea, something that's human made, uh, something that uh, is not the kind of thing you'd find in, uh, in nature. Um, you might find a granola bar that says it has all natural ingredients. And you might think that because they're all natural ingredients, it's got to be healthy for you. Um, now, I've never been to the great uh, granola bar orchard where they gather these granola bars from nature. Uh, I've never seen a field, uh, an amber field of granola bars uh, when I drive through Illinois or someplace. Um, but I do know that if I were ever to crack open a diet soda, what's in there is not natural. Um, there's all sorts of funny chemicals, colorings of things to make it look like something else and taste like something else. It's also probably not something I find in nature. Uh, the diet soda really is an artificial thing. It's made by humans, um, not the kind of thing you'd find uh, in the forest, unless someone left it there. Um, we also, though, apply this idea of nature not just to big abstract concepts, but to uh, individual creatures. And so some of you have dogs, and you probably notice that your dog will bark at uh, people that visit your house. Some of you have cats. Now, if your cat barked at a visitor to your house, you think that's pretty strange. You might even say that's unnatural. So this idea of nature applies not just to the collective of things that we see around us that are not human things, not human-made things, uh, individual items that we might uh, pick up off the ground that we know are not made by humans, um, but it also applies to, to living things uh, and probably other things as well uh, that we might encounter. There's a nature of a dog that's different from the nature of a, of a cat. So what's uh, strange about this is that if you go back to the nature walk, um, you could imagine that uh, what you're seeing there are things built by living creatures, right? Uh, a bird's nest, uh, this is the kind of question I raised down here, uh, a bird naturally builds a nest, and we call that nature. Uh, if a human builds a log cabin, how is that any different? How is that not natural? 
Um, so one of the questions that you have to wrestle with with nature is, how do humans fit into it? Or do they not fit into it? Um, is there a human nature we can we can point to, like the nature of a dog or the nature of a cat? Um, and why is it that we call a bird's nest a natural thing and a log cabin uh, an artificial thing, an unnatural thing? Um, this is a puzzle that has no simple answer. There's a lot of possible answers you might think of. A lot of people have given different possible answers. Um, but the fact there is no clear, simple answer uh, suggests it's a really a question worth thinking about, uh, a question that uh, if you look at the world in one way, it would give you one kind of answer and lead you to maybe act in a certain way, and a different answer might lead you to act or think about the world in a different way. And that's really good, really important, really interesting. And that's why you should not go to the dictionary to find out what nature means. You should think about how that use, word is used uh, by people around you. If you mean a really obscure word like obfuscation, that's one thing. But uh, a word nature that has a kind of common usage, uh, you want to think carefully about what that common usage really uh, leads to. Now, this question of how do humans fit into nature, um, as I mentioned, has puzzled people for probably forever as soon as they start thinking about that. And uh, one of the people who really tried to work this out was a guy named Aristotle, who if you've had a class with me before, you've heard me talk about him. Um, he was a student of Plato, uh, and so he came from that world of Greece, of Socrates and uh, Plato and, and uh, then Aristotle, ancient Athens. Alexander the Great was Aristotle's student, so that's what kind of teacher he was. Um, and he, uh, he thought about the role of humans in the whole universe uh, and the nature of the universe. Uh, he thought about uh, the nature of political societies. He thought about the nature of uh, household societies. Um, he looked at nature. He was a student of, uh, of nature. Um, one of his more important books was called Nature, called The Physics. Um, and then another of his more important books was called After Nature uh, or Beyond Nature. And we call that the metaphysics. Um, so this idea of nature and studying nature was uh, was really critical to his uh, his thought, and uh, in such a way that uh, um, you know because his ideas about nature might not have been right, we 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 sometimes forget how important the idea and the study of nature was to uh, to Aristotle. But um, I want to give you some sense of of exactly what he thought, exactly what he thought was going on, particularly with that question we started with, which is why do things happen? And he talked to this in pretty clear language. I mean, he gives kind of four reasons for why a thing happens. Um, and when he means why does a thing happen, he's really looking at uh, why does a change happen within nature? Um, why does uh, uh, an acorn grow into an oak tree? Why does a puppy grow into a dog? Uh, things like that. And so there's different ways to number these. Uh, this is one traditional way to number them. Uh, the first he calls uh, the material cause. The stuff that a thing is made of is part of what makes it what it is. So if you think about a tree, uh, the tree, you know, by observation, by watching, by watching trees grow, by thinking about what helps a tree grow. Um, there's some dirt in there. There's some water in there. And there's some sunshine involved, too. If you have a if you plant a tree inside your house and, and uh, don't let the sunshine on it, it's not going to grow. Um, and so what makes of a tree is some combination, if you're an ancient Greek person or Aristotle, of things like dirt and water and sunshine that somehow become the tree. But that's not all there's to it. Um, you can't just stir that stuff together and get a tree. You need to start with a seed, an acorn for an oak tree. Um, so there's something about the acorn uh, that has inside it the, uh, the oak tree, but it's not a little tiny oak tree, although there are people that imagine things like that. You know, there's something about the nature of an acorn or the nature of oak trees, that they're connected to each other, and that the, uh, the acorn is the seed, the, the, the essence, if you want, of uh, what becomes the, uh, the oak tree. Now today, um, or for the last uh, 50 or 60 years or 70 years now, um, that notion actually corresponds very closely to what we think about uh, as, uh, as DNA. The information that tells you what you're going to be is encoded in your DNA, in your genetics. Um, and the correspondence between the way biologists talk about DNA and the way ancient philosophers, ancient physicists thought about uh, formal causes is eerily close. Uh, and I think it's... Uh, I, I get in trouble when I when I say it's the same, but it's the same. All right, so we need to have like a seed. Okay, if you're going to have an oak tree, you can't just have dirt, water, sunshine. You need also an oak tree seed. And of course, the same thing applies to any other kind of uh, creature. Um, you can't get a you can't do anything to your puppy chow to make your to make a puppy, um, but you can take a puppy to the puppy chow and get a big dog uh, if you want. So there's something else that's needed. Some uh, definition of of the tree is literally what. Uh, uh, what Aristotle would say, he also thinks about mathematically. You know, the definition of a circle makes it what it is. Uh, that would fall under the formal cause.
Um, you also need some kind of what he calls a moving or a fishing cause. That's the technical term he uses. Um, so if you just have seed, dirt, water, sunshine, nothing's going to happen until these are mixed together in the proper way. And that has to come from something outside the earth and water and seed and sunshine itself. So you might plant the seed and watch the tree grow. Um, what usually happens is that a squirrel eats the acorn and uh, poops and the seed gets planted that way. Something from the outside needs to motivate uh, this change that's going to happen, the change that makes the tiny little seed uh, appear into a, a giant oak tree. Um, and uh, the fourth cause he, uh, he, he causes is uh, he gives it the final cause. He doesn't mean the last numerically. What he means is uh, the purpose or the, uh, the end to which everything is progressing, um, this example. So, um, um, you know, for the, the, the purpose of an oak tree, the purpose of a dog is to actually make more dogs happen, make more oak trees happen. Um, you might think of it as uh, the purpose of the oak tree is to fill a niche in nature. It's a place for trees to live and to provide wood, I don't know, whatever oak trees do in nature. Um, but it's uh, something also that, uh, that humans recognize. Oak trees, of course, are very big trees. Um, they're the ones most likely to be hit by, hit by lightning or more likely to be hit by lightning than, uh, than other trees. And so across many, many different cultures, there are connections between oak trees in particular and uh, the gods and the most uh, powerful of the gods. So whether Zeus or Jupiter uh, or even the god in the Old Testament, uh, he, if you look very closely, hangs out in oak trees uh, sometimes. Um, there's a connection between a connection between uh, these giant sacred trees, these giant trees, and and some kind of sacred embodiment of the forces uh, of uh, of nature. Um, Aristotle also applies this to uh, to human operations. Uh, so most famously, he applies it to a house, a home, um, and he thinks about the uh, the wood and materials that make up the house, the architectural plan, uh, Bob the builder who comes along and puts your house together. And then the idea that the house serves a purpose, a place for people to live, a place to call home. Um, and in this sense, I think Aristotle really wants us to think about the way humans build houses and the way birds build houses. You know, the way these things happen in nature, and the way humans do the same things that happen in nature, but we call the house that Bob the Builder made artificial. Um, well, this model of science, this model of thinking about science, so this idea that we need to study material and formal efficient and final causes, um, for whatever reason, held sway in Europe for about 1,500 years, and it passed through different forms uh, and came in bits and pieces to, uh, to uh, Western Europe uh, through um, mostly Islam, in fact, uh, that preserved these texts, and then they were transferred slowly to, uh, to, to Europe. Um, but uh, when Europe discovered these ideas, it, you know, Europeans discovered these ideas in the 13th and 14th centuries, to them it was really exciting. It was a, a way to move forward in science. Um, but what also happened is that these ideas became criticized, um, and uh, there's a sort of unpacking or undoing of Aristotle uh, that's worth mentioning really quickly before I, I wrap up. So the first thing to go was this idea of formal of, uh, of formal causes. This um, what people realized in the 14th, 15th centuries is that uh, what we call an acorn is just a name we put on something that happens to be like other acorns. Um, and so calling it an acorn doesn't make it an acorn. Um, it's whatever it is. Um, and that, uh, that idea that we can impose a definition on things in the world is something that we should be very careful about. Um, a kind of modern example of that is uh, this um, lingering controversy over the nature of, of, of what Pluto is. Um, you know, people would say Pluto is a planet or not a planet. Um, Pluto doesn't care. You know, uh, Pluto is what Pluto is. Whether we call it a planet or not, doesn't change Pluto or the nature of Pluto, whatever Pluto is. Right. So this is still an issue with this. Um, the uh, story of uh, the theory of evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution, is really based, it's hinged on his recognition that uh, the idea of species we have in our head is just an idea in our head. Uh, the species don't care that they're one species and not another species. Uh, that's a totally different subject, but it's an example of how you know, over hundreds of years, this problem of assigning definitions to things in nature uh, gets us in trouble and can't get us in trouble. Um, what we have to do is let nature do the defining for us, and that's a very tricky and very difficult uh, kind of thing. Um, the next thing uh, that really fell uh, before modern science, or to modern science, you might say, this idea of Aristotle, um, I point to Newton who does this, and he points out that uh, uh, for Aristotle, different kinds of matter behave in different ways. And what Newton points out in his, uh, as we'll see in a few, uh, well, videos, I guess, 
Um, all matter behaves the same way. The law of gravity applies to everything, uh, everything, whatever it's, you know, according to its mass. Um, for Aristotle, you know, fire goes up and earthy things go down. So there really are different kinds of uh, materials in the universe. Uh, for Newton, he points out that everything's really the same. Of course, modern contemporary science uh, pushes that even farther. And even the gold and silver and hydrogen and helium are made of just protons and neutrons. The same stuff uh, creates everything. And so the thing you are doesn't really depend on the fact that you're made of protons and neutrons because everything's made of protons and neutrons and electrons, you know, at least in terms of uh, the material world. Um, about that time, people realized that, uh, like it or not, nature doesn't really care that you need a place to live. Um, the way that, uh, uh, that animals, creatures behave, living things behave, is uh, sort of leads to their survival. And their survival isn't the goal of nature. Rather, it's the goal of the creature to survive. And so this idea that there's a purpose to nature, um, uh, a reason for why, a reason why things happen in the long run, uh, that faded to basically not being allowed to be talked about in science uh, shortly after Newton's time. And then finally, in the 20th century, uh, there still was this idea that uh, things happen because A leads to B leads to C leads to D. Um, if you study quantum mechanics for a little bit or study thermodynamics in the 19th century, you realize that it's a better <clears throat> better picture of the world to say <clears throat> things just happen. Fundamentally, uh, the processes that, uh, that lead to the, the things we see in nature are random. Uh, the way uh, your mother's and father's genes combined to produce you was a random process, um, no matter on some level, it was a random process. And so uh, even the idea of, of, of uh, efficient causality, that A makes B happen, um, in modern science is something that we are should be very cautious about saying. This isn't to say that like if you get the virus, you'll get sick, uh, but rather that on the most fundamental levels, uh, the virus doesn't care. It doesn't want to make you sick. It just does. It doesn't try to get in your lungs. It just does. Um, these things that we think uh, are uh, nature acting in a certain way are really just us projecting our ideas about ourselves and how we act onto this idea of, uh, of nature. And so unpacking that, undoing that is a very, has been a very long and difficult process. It's taken almost a thousand years to really do this. And we're not really done. Um, but as we've done it, we've had a better and deeper, more full understanding of the thing we're after in the first place, which is an understanding of nature. So um, to go back to the question of gravity, why things fall, uh, what we see is what, what we really need to do is find a better way to describe uh, the motion of a falling object. And so that's going to come uh, real soon. All right. Thanks.